all the way from Pasadena, California, back home in his old stomping ground. Here with us is Leslie Johnson. Wait a Best minute. known no, as I don't Lisa live in Pasadena. Wait a minute. I don't live in Pasadena. What, what, what do you call that area? I live in Paradise. <laughs> I'm 13 hours north of Pasadena. <laughs> and that's called Paradise? It's Pas Paradise. Uh, on my they fire. lie about you online. They say you're in Pasadena. So you're in Paradise, California, uh, in the mountains. So it's my pleasure to bring <laughs> Lazy Lester's thoughts and experiences to you through this conversation. His career in the blues goes back to the 50s, the era when blues flourished in the South, where people made their own guitars from, from screen wire, and it paid a dollar for a harmonica. Lazy was born in Taurus, Louisiana, which is just up the road from where I grew up, Maringouin, Louisiana. He was born June 20th, 1933. He made a name for himself singing swamp blues and playing harmonica and guitar, singing in his distinguished deep vocals. His musical genre includes rhythm and blues and country music. Lazy recorded with Excello Records, as the name says on his t-shirt, Alligator and Tellar Studios. On the legendary blues original, Slim, Lightning Slim's recording of Hoodoo Man, when you hear Lightning Slim say, now play your harmonica, son, he's talking to Lazy Lester. The two of them met on a bus uh, when Lightning was on his way to a recording session at J.D. Miller's studio. Lightning's harmonica player didn't show up and Lazy stepped in. The recording was Bad Luck Blues, but that recording turned out to be lucky for both Lightning and Lazy. That fortunate meet meeting began a long collaboration between the two blues men and the recording studio where the recording was made. J.D. Miller's studio in Crowley. It was Miller who gave Lazy Lester the name Lazy Lester, uh, looking at what he thought was uh, his laid back style. In 2003, Martin Scorsese included Lester in his blues tribute concert at Radio Music City Hall called Martin Scorsese Presents the Blues, Lightning in a Bottle. And it also gives me great pleasure to tell you Lazy Lester received the Living Legend Award at the 2014 Baton Rouge Blues Foundation Blues Gala in August at the Louisiana Arts and Science Museum. And as you can imagine, this is a man with a rich history. So let's see what we can find out today when we talk to Lazy. So, a swamp man living in the mountains in California? <laughs> What's that like? <laughs> <laughs> this is not sweaty. <laughs> I was listening to all those, that's re all those recordings that uh, I've done with Lightning. The first recording I did with Lightning was Sugar Plum. It was the very first one, and I think it was 1952. Bad Luck Blues was, was done with Schoolboy Cleveland White or either why Bill Phillips was me. Now we got the fact. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> that was they always call me when you want to know because I know. Sugar Plum was the first recording yeah, in 1952. Yeah, of 52 or 53. It was the first Lightning enough. Slim's record that was released on Excello. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm grown, that's what this other side was. I'm grown and sugar plum. That was the very first mm -hmm. one. But it is true that, that you had a long collaboration with Lightning Slim. The oh, two oh, of you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I recorded most of the rest of the recordings he did. I did 98% uh, uh, of them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them were done at the J.D. Miller studio? Uh, all of them. All of them. And Miller say that you... You seem to be laid back. Are you laid back? I don't know what that means. Yeah, me either. But <laughs> <laughs> are you what that means? Or you don't, you don't know, know what it means? I laid back. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I never use those pretty words because I don't really know what laid back means. Well, well, here's I the thing. I just don't. I never get in a hurry. Right. That's for sure. So how's the name served you, Lazy Lester? Because, I mean, during oh. that time, it was popular to have names like Lonesome, Sunny, Buddy, Muddy, Lightning, Howling, Rockin'. How has the name Lazy Lester served you? It served me fine, I mean, because <laughs> it had so many it's slims around, <laughs> it, you know, I didn't want to be one of the harmonica <laughs> slim to say it for the film. Or Leslie Johnson, uh, so, I mean, he asked me when they say, uh, are you 
Are you lazy? I said, no. I said, I'm just tired. In fact, you were quite hard working. Huh? In fact, you were quite a hard working man. Didn't you farm? No. You just grew up on one? No. Why do they think you want a farm? In well, Taurus, Louisiana, they had farms now. Well, look, I left there when I was three years old. Uh huh. But didn't you I, farm? I was born in 33, and in 36, we moved to Scotlandville. Mm -hmm. Well, set the record straight. You moved to Scotlandville. Where'd you live in Scotlandville? No, a little place they called Red Stick Alley by uh -huh. the railroad. Or, uh, at the time, they didn't have names for those streets. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I know exactly where it is. Yeah. Now. Well, what age did you actually start playing music? Uh, when I started playing music, I should have been around 16, 17, 17. And which instrument did you pick up first? Guitar. And why guitar? Because that's all I had. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you happen to have had one. No, so who my, bought my it? Brother, my brother mm -hmm. bought a guitar from, from an old man named Joe Payton. Mm -hmm. he, he lived in Cairo, Illinois, which was my mother's first teenage boyfriend when they was coming up. Mm. And the years and years, you know, they hadn't seen each other. And we was walking down from the the, uh, the abattoir, which was the slaughter pen. The and slaughter see, pen. Yeah, with, with, the, with the butcher, we had going up there to pick up some, you know, liver and whatever, you know, stuff that you can go and get from the slaughter pen. But anyway, we saw that bus with Jay Payton I know this old truck said Jay Payton, and she said Jay Payton. I know that name. So uh, she went to see who was that Jay Payton, and we walked there, and that, and that man with a mouthful of gold, and he looked at her and recognized her and hadn't seen her in years and years, because he had moved to Carroll, Illinois. And they started talking. So later on that day, <coughs> pardon me. The weather down here in the swamp gets you, huh? <laughs> mm, no, I picked it up along the way. Uh, okay. <laughs> he came over and brought his guitar. And he could play a guitar and sing. That man had the prettiest voice. I never heard anybody sing like that in my life, really. I mean, I've, I've heard a lot of guys, but he was the greatest I ever heard. And I've been in this world a long time. But anyway, my brother wanted that guitar. But I mean, I, I, I paid it no attention. I just liked the sound of it, you know. So my brother bought it from him, $12. I never forget, $12 for that thing. And he paid him $2 a week until he paid for it because he was working at the Florida pen. And I took sick, and I couldn't go to school. And I got up, and I crawled up there and got He's get to get from under the bed, and I brought it back to my bed. He could get back in the bed with that guitar, and I was listening to Ray Rogers on WTPS in New Orleans. I never forget that. <laughs> and he was playing all those Jimmy Rogers songs, and I started messing around. I could get the sound of the, that guitar, and I just kept working at it and developed into to play country music when I was a young age. Oh, wow. I, and that was, that, was, that was the love of my life. Yeah, so you and started, I, I actually. Just, I just recorded a country album down in I Austin. I know. Yeah, I got it with me. Well, I great. We're going to talk about that some more, too. But you also, along the way, picked up the harmonica. When and why? Well, my brother, he couldn't do play the guitar, so he bought some harmonicas. And he gave them to me because he couldn't hit a lick. But my mother played. <coughs> Pardon me. And I started to play with the harmonica. Well, Wayne Rainey and Lonnie Gloss and all those guys like that. And I liked the sound of it. I'm drink with you. So I finally got the hang of it. And uh, I started messing around with it, and it just developed into to playing harmonica. 
So what I'm hearing is no one taught you to play the guitar, no one taught you to no. play harmonica. No, that's the reason I can't play with a hoot drum because nobody <laughs> taught me. <laughs> but we'll pay to hear you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so your brother never did actually no, become a musician, not. it was you. No, no, my, my brother next to me, it was called Kingfish, I guess you probably knew he was. He played with Lightning, he played with Slim Hoppo, he played with Sun Wolfhawk. Son, uh, that's my homeboy. Yeah. He's from Maringwin, yeah. Oh, well, 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 the youngster that played with him called Kingfish, that's my brother. Mm-hmm, okay. He, played, he used to play bass and second guitar and then went with, with Wolfhawk for years. Now, where and did you play before you started recording? Where did you play music? Well, I'll tell you. We had a little band, John Jackson and I started a band and called Big John and the Rhythm Rockers. Mm. That's what we called ourselves. And we used to play around different clubs, around Maryland and Port Barry. Did you play at Hideout? Oh, no. oh yeah. That's my dad's club. No, I, uh, <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, I'll go. I didn't do that. And all up in uh, St. Francisville, what we call Teddy Martinville. Uh -huh. We used to play all over the place, up in Woodville, Mississippi. And then after I met Lightning, uh, before I met Lightning, Ray O'Neill and I, Kenny's daddy, yes. we started playing together. And, and our first gig was right there. Uh, at Joe Bradley's in Glen, mm -hmm. and that was our first gig. And I know it, it Joe was Bradley. Just the three of us: uh, Rayful, uh, uh, Wu Gaines, and me. Mm -hmm. And we played around there for, for ages. Mm -hmm. And what were those I clubs like? Lightning. I mean, people people have an idea of the blues artist, but what were these clubs like that you were playing in? Was it, was it a crowd? Or was it well mic'd? Was it a good sound system? Um, now that's. All we know, we was playing music. We could hear each other. And people liked and it. And that's all that matters. Yes. You know, we don't have all that high-tech stuff like they have now, you know. All that sit on and ploop, 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 listen to this. We just played it and, and drank some beer and wine, and that was it. And it worked. Yeah. And people liked it. Yeah. And danced to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, when did you start to like the audience? I mean, did you, I mean, when you were playing at first, you were just playing for yourself. You weren't thinking about no. performing. No, I never played for myself. No, when, but when you were <laughs> learning. Yeah, but I, I, was, I was playing for someone in my own mind. Oh, awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I always knew that I was going to be playing for more than myself. Uh-huh. You know, so that's mm -hmm. why I never wore those play for myself musicians. Like a lot of musicians out here now play for themselves. Yeah. So when you actually did have an audience in front of you that you had pictured in your head, what was that experience like? Well, it was just came natural. Because you had already because, been used yeah, to it because in I your knew head. It was there. That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> when you're when you're playing the blues and you watch everyone having a good time, very often you're singing what some people call hard luck stories and people are dancing to it and, and cheering and saying, yes, I get what you're saying, I feel good. Because I know when I go to hear the blues, it's like if I walk in and Lazy Lester is blowing out that first wail of the harmonica, everything else just falls away and I think, yeah, everything's all right now. Can you give us some idea of how that feels to you to know that you're doing that for us? No, that's a good question. I'm glad. <laughs> Because I've asked some bad ones so far. Yeah, we had some, we had some, yeah. You know, that's one thing about when you're on stage playing music. I mean, of me, for instance. When I'm out there playing music, I'm playing for you, me, and whoever listening. You know, it's just it's a, from the heart thing, you know. And that's, that's the way I mean. That's that's how I feel, you know. It's it's something hard to explain when you're on stage playing. Well, I think you're doing a good job of explaining it because you're saying you're doing it for us to feel good. Yeah. And you're feeling good too. Oh yeah. Um, and so when you go on the bandstand, I mean, you're feeling good, but yet you're singing about trouble. 
How can someone understand that as feeling good? Well, I don't think too much about trouble. Unless somebody's in trouble, that's, <laughs> that's yet. And it, you know, you could close your eyes and throw a brick and whatever you hit, it's going to rain, you know? Yeah. So that's where music is. Yeah. Regardless of what you sing or what you say, it hits somebody somewhere. Yes. It hits yeah. somebody in a, in a truth place that says yeah. yes. And that's what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it doesn't happen to me. Okay. Some of those things happen to me that I sang about, and people have no idea what, what, they, what they really mean. Like that song, the same thing will happen to you. Yeah. Don't ever write your name on the jailhouse wall. Uh-huh. If somebody wants to know what those words mean, I think you listen to them and you figure it out. Well, would you tell us? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening. No, that, that when I started off that song, said don't ever write your name on the jailhouse wall. These funny little signs are true. If you don't believe what I say, the same thing will happen to you. No, but, the, but no, you got to put something that rhymes with it, but that mean much. Mm -hmm. So when you cut your toenails off, don't ever put them in the crack. Before you leave the jailhouse, you're going to meet yourself coming back. <laughs> you know. Now, when the, when the line said, shot got out the other day and I told him to watch his step, but he wouldn't listen to what I said he was back before he left. That's the true one. See, now that other one was just for Ryan. Uh-huh. Now, I know you think I'm crazy, but I do know that it's true. If you don't believe me, what I say, the same thing happened to you. Yeah. Because, see, I, I know about that. Because I, I was, oh, I'm sorry. I will experience that. See? Yeah. Jail. And when you see something not yours laying around, it's best you leave it be. If you pick it up, they're going to catch you sure as hell, and you're going to wind up in here with me. Now, where was I? In jail? <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting smart. I'm getting it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yet when, when we're listening to it, we're having a good time because you're help, you know, helping us feel the truth, too, yeah. because we're recognizing we got to watch what we do or what we think about others because we may... Yeah. end up experiencing it. Yeah. Let, let's get to, uh, you know, uh, being a performer as long as you have, there have been some tough times, and one of the tough times was recording at J.D. Miller Studio and writing songs and having him put his name on your songs. Uh, and after that, you, after you got enough of that, you left the business. I want to hear that story. Now, that's what I don't want to go through. Well, tell me part <laughs> of it. I, I mean, because many blues artists felt betrayed a lot of times by those who were supposedly oh, uh, helping them, which you would say he did help you. Oh, but you would also say that that hurt. The greatest experience in the world was me being there. Mm -hmm. And I got uh, education from being there. Now that money that I supposed to have gotten, I'm like, wow, it don't matter with me. I got what I needed, that education. Cause that money was gonna be gone anyway. Mm. And the ones that really got all of that big money, they're not here anymore. The ones that made the millions. 1958, I recorded this. You know? Say which one that is. I'm a lover, not a fighter. All right. When the Kinks recorded that first uh, album in 62 or 63, that was one of the big sellers. And the Thunderbirds. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. Sugar Coated Love. Sugar Coated Love. And that was sold to Thunderbirds. Now, he was eight years old when I recorded that. And when he got old enough to form the, the band, that's what sold the Thunderbirds. And he never forgot that. And I did his wedding. But anyway, getting back to this, the guy said, man, you've been out there all these years and didn't make any money. I said, good, I didn't make any. I said, because the one that made that big money, Dead. I said, now good, I didn't make it. He said, why is that? Why, why is why you, it's good you didn't make money? I said, the ones that made all that, got all that money, those millions, they could buy an early death. I said, I couldn't buy that early death, so I had no other choice but live. Oh, <laughs> wow. So, <laughs> so you have just given us a wealthy message. That's yeah. so rich. Yeah, you know what real wealth is. Yeah, I know what wealth is. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I know. You're still out here performing and uh, having fun. Yes. That's what it's all about. If you're not having fun, they'd rather, man, these guys didn't pay me. They owe me two hundred more dollars. Oh, I would buy that. If you give me two dollars, it's you know. And and I heard that when you left the blues, you didn't miss it too much. You got to do one of your hobbies. It, it, but I did a lot of stuff. Fishing. <laughs> oh, I got a chance to fish, but I turned in to be a truck driver, furniture mover. I worked for Greyhound Van Lines, Calpenter Furniture out of Chicago. I worked in, I went up north Louisiana, and I worked in the woods, a, a, a lumberjack. And Professional you put those tree cutter, yes, I can do it now. Dangerous stuff for guitar players' oh, yeah. hands. And yeah. you worked in a foundry, molting hot metal. No, 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 no. You didn't no, work no, in a foundry. No, no, I was there with those guys, but yeah. I didn't. You know, they. But, I, but a tree I cutter, in, that's putting I your hands in, at risk. Oh yes, and now the rattlesnakes that big in the woods. <laughs> oh, uh, but I, mean, I never did get bit by one, but I've stepped around a lot of them. But uh, I got a lot of experience. In. <laughs> so, so then you then when Lightning went on tour again. Uh, his manager, Fred Reif, asked you to come and play with Lightning again. In and 1971? Yeah. Yeah, the, the big, big uh, University of Chicago, big festival. And I yeah. came up And in, you were glad in, to be back in the blues? Well, I came and did that, and I stayed up there with them uh, about uh, practically a month. And I came back to Louisiana and went right back to the woods. And I didn't want to do it. Now, I had to go back until 1975. And then you start your own tour with Rife. Uh, yeah. You managed your tours. passed away in 74. Mm -hmm. And 1975, Slim Hoppo's sister, friend, told her that I was in Louisiana, in Monroe, where they lived. And say, so the one way was up here with, with, with Lightning. She said, oh, well, I don't know who that was with Lightning. So they started talking and say, "What? Well, say that's Lester was up here with Lightning. So he played on those your, your brother's records, that scratched my back and everything else. He recorded in that studio. He was playing on it. So she called me and asked me if I wanted to come up there and visit them because her brother was dead, Lightning was dead, and I was the only one left that you know knew about that. So she sent me a." Delta Airline ticket, and the next that was in seventy, the last of seventy four, July the fourth, seventy five. I caught it that Delta and and went to Pontiac, and I stayed there for thirty years. <laughs> <laughs> when you coming home? <laughs> no, we need but, you back here. No, but see what happened when I got there. Some of her friends, Jesse. And May, they call her. They call his brother is in Detroit, and say, "Lazy Lester is up here." Say, "Yeah, say, yeah, the one that used to play with Lightning and and and, uh, and Slim Harpo, tell his brother." So he called his friend, and about four hours later, they had about fifteen different musicians came up to Pontiac, bringing the instruments and set up on the parking lot, and we played music <laughs> on Gabby's parking lot. And people from, you could come down uh, uh, wide track and you could hear the music, you could turn it and come right down there and park on the side. <laughs> and by two o'clock the next morning, it was like a festival. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> It was crazy, just like that. That's, that that was the fourth of July, seventy-five, when the day I got there. And every holiday, or every any time somebody a football game, everybody from Detroit would come up and, and, and gather on Gabby's parking lot, and we'd play music. Wow. Yeah, and that's that what started all of that. When yeah. I got there. And you stayed out here? Uh, stayed I, out here playing? Well, I stayed there for 30 years, and I moved to California. But, I mean, you've continued to play. Oh, oh yeah, then. yeah. And we're going to hear you tonight at 8.15. Hopefully. And thank you for straightening <laughs> out some of the stories. That yeah. Some of the lies they put online and made them up. Exactly. And now we got the story. I'm so glad to set some of the records straight. And um, 
Next time I'll call you before I prepare for you your know, interview. No, uh, let, me, let me tell you this. I, I think they're closing us out. You know, they don't yeah. Work. If, if they quickly hear, wrap it up. If they if they want to hear something, they, if you want to hear if you want to hear the truth, you always got time for it. Hmm. <laughs> or you make time for the truth. I if think somebody, your way of thinking is best. If you but. know, if you talking to somebody that know what they're talking about, say, well, I heard somebody else say this like this, and blah, blah blah blah. But somebody else wasn't there. You know, I didn't see somebody else because I was there, and if. If somebody else was there, I would have seen them. So you always ask me. But right well, quick. Let me ask my producer. Right, right Can quick. He finish the story. Oh, he got tape. Okay. He got, okay. He got, they he they got, say they're good. I just want to check. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, I know. Because, you know, anybody, anybody, that's the reason I live to be 82 years old. Because I always took time to listen. Mm. These guys wrote down so much junk that wasn't true. They always ask somebody else that don't, didn't know anything. So when they find out who really know, they're too ashamed to ask. You see Becky said right there, she, she know. They called Jockey, asked Jockey about who's playing on this, uh, on this session. I don't know. Ask Lester. Call Warren Storm, who's playing on this? I don't know, ask okay, so Lester. what story you want us to know? This about these guys just writing up all this okay. stuff with the magazine. Yeah, yeah. So now they want to know who really did this, and they were too they're too ashamed to ask me. Now they know that I know, because the one that they asked told them to ask me, which they should have asked in the first in place. In the first place. <laughs> now they're too ashamed. They're accused. too ashamed to ask me. Now I'm gonna make them give me the big buck, or they don't get nothing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Lazy Lester, everybody. See him on stage at 8.15 on the Swamp Blues stage. Thank you so much. I'm Maxine Crump.